Welcome to the Post World Podcast. Amazing. <laughs> Welcome to the Post World Podcast from Carmack Studios, Bunker Studios, somewhere hidden in Berlin. I'm Pablo Eneri, your host, and today's guest is Mr. Fritz Dickerhoff, also known as Fritz, Fritz Windisch, <laughs> who is a cultural manager and also known for being art director of one of the most vanguardist music festivals, Carbitz. Fritz, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Um, how was it like you started uh, with man business, business management and you ended up in uh, cultural events or artistic events? How, was, how do you think this was related to each other, looking back? Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's a quite long story, but we have time. <laughs> yeah, we have some time. Um, yeah, well, like, like when you're young and then you finish school and you decide, like, what should I do now? Okay, I made a social service in a hospital. And I wanted to study medicine, but then in the hospital, I realized, okay, that's not my job. I can imagine. It's, I mean, it's, I like, I would like to be a doctor, but the hospital atmosphere and being in this, in the operation wards and the whole, I don't know, the, the attitude between the doctors, it, it has kind of a military hierarchy which is also necessary when you're operating on an open heart it has, it has to be strict no very protocols strict rules and, and protocols mm -hmm. and i was just like okay that's that's not my world and then i also didn't want to open up the practice and the medicine very hard studies and um then i was searching just for what can i do and i found a study that had one year abroad in the curriculum. And that was the most important thing for me, that I was just like, I want to leave Germany as soon as possible. And then I found the studies in Bremen, and the op there was the opportunity included to spend one year abroad in a developing country. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then I decided, okay, I'll just apply for that. Then I got re rejected because it was like only 800, or no, it was like 800... Uh, applications and only 30 people could could do this study mm -hmm. so um and then i moved to hamburg and i had already in, an, in a record label um an internship offered you're from kiel right from kiel yeah northern germany near to denmark um and then i moved like i was on the way moving to hamburg already had a flat and blah blah blah, blah and everything was signed and then this university from bremen called me and said like yeah one spot got free and from a lottery uh, we picked your name And okay. just, you want to have it or not? And I'm just like, wait, uh, Nia, uh, yeah, you have 15 minutes. Please call me back. And I'm just like, okay. Um, and this is how I studied then economics somehow. Okay. So I ended up in this kind of elite economic thing where I never like I never expected to that they take me. Um, so it's not specifically business management that you studied. It, it was called international studies of global management. Um, so it sounds a, big. <laughs> yeah, but it's not that big. It was just it's more about like intercultural, um, yeah, if, yeah, kind of intercultural management connected to different like contract management and laws mm. and what you like how like joint ventures between two countries. International business thing. Yeah, <laughs> and then. Uh, one part of this was, okay, we had to choose one language. I choose Spanish, and then you choose one country, um, then a Spanish-speaking country, which is then middle of South America. And because my grandfather um, always, like, he he was on the Graf Spee, which sank in the Rio de la Plata, was a warship in the Second World War. Wow, wow. And then he exiled in Argentina and lived with the gauchos, like, um, a bit clandestine. Then he made... Your grandfather. Yeah, as a, in a Second World War, as a German wow. soldier. And then he always taught me how gauchos peel their oranges. So, and th that was the thing. I grew up with chimichurri and and the the, the, the orange peeling method of the gauchos. How do gauchos peel their oranges? I will not tell I you. Never heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel not so Argentinian right now. No, no. But, but then I, mo I I had to go to Argentina to find out if this was true what he taught me, and I never found a gaucho that peeled the orange like my grandfather did. But somehow that was the thing that I choose to go to Argentina instead to go to Mexico like my my mates were doing or to Chile or even if there was this crisis that time and I just 
Yeah, and the studies were just like, you don't learn so much, you know, like business is not a science. Business is, you learn what's actually now the business. If you study business now, you learn something completely different than... Social media. That, yeah, that what I've learned back in the days, mm. it's not like medicine or biology. I mean, this is, some, this is more a science, you know, a cell is dividing itself and there are like rules and laws. Hmm. So, and with the economics, it's kind of always changing. Mm-hmm. But I thought it's good because afterwards I can do whatever I want. It's a bit like you have an open field with economics, more or less. You can go in, in all directions. Yeah, we had a guest, uh, Amaury, who uh, comes from business studies and, and now he's um, uh, into street art and making collages and so And we were talking about this false dichotomy, you know, that if you do business, then you, do, you don't do art and vice versa, because it happens a lot that artists don't know how to manage their own uh, pro, uh, uh, works in a way, for example, you know. And when you know a business, maybe you succeed much more at that, even if it's your work as an artist. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would like to come to this point later. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it fits in the story now. Perfect. Because then, um, yeah, I studied this. Um, I went to Buenos Aires, lived there, uh, got connected um, with the music. That in Buenos Aires? In Buenos Aires, yeah. Because I was before I was just like, I was already heading my band, my reggae band, and was playing like on reggae parties. And okay. And I went with all my dub plates and my reggae seven inch to Argentina and see <laughs> what's going on there. But there was no reggae party at all. So, no. <laughs> and then I got into raves there, literally, and, and, and got connected with German music, with German minimal music from Cologne, Compact, and all this. So I, In Argentina, you got connected with Compact. Yeah, because then I met Dilo, uh, Elephant Pixel Dilo, and from Eagle yeah. Records. And he taught me all this, like, he, he showed me the, the, these songs, you know, like it was like, it started with Luciano and then, but all this compact stuff and Michael Maya and I don't know. And then I got into Ricardo Villalobos and I realized this is all German music or German produced or from a German publisher. Hmm. And I always connected like in Germany at Rave only with Marusha and Love Parade, mm -hmm. Sven Veit stuff that I was not liking so much at mm -hmm. that time. And, but Then I started producing this kind of music because it was it was possible. And then the first time with the computer and being there in Argentina, there was the parties. And then I came back to Germany, filled with this party energy from Buenos Aires and um, with the knowledge of that I can produce this music. And mm. I was like super excited about like just having my little computer with a sound card and I can, I can, I have a studio at home. It was the first, I don't need to. It was this time, no? It was this time yeah. of where, yeah. they, where, where it really started when Ableton Live One was on and you were just like, wow. Well, when I playing with, with a laptop was not still lame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was a discovering, especially what you say, what you mentioned, like compact records and so. It was um, a hiatus, you say, I think. It was a turning point um, worldwide. Um, regarding the aesthetics of the sound of techno music, you know, or electronic music. Yeah. And I think a lot of us at that time got really interested for the first time in club or something similar to club music because of this. It was so different from love parade music at the time, you know, and so uh, there was a special uh, texture, aesthetics. And, and also time for the sounds. It was mm -hmm. like, it was very, that sound was important suddenly. It was not, not not the the party itself it was like it was about every little every little sound in the song was there for a reason and if it's not it wasn't if it's not perfect you just take it out and then you just have these eight perfect sounds that play together in this minimal track and this was so fascinating for me you can listen to it for hours and hours and hours yeah. and hours <laughs> and it's also home listening when you are perceptive enough let's say yeah Um, yeah, it works both ways. Yeah, no? that's also what I like about it. And when you came to, you came back then to Hamburg or to Berlin? No, to Bremen. And to Bremen. And then um, I was just like, "Fuck, all parties here suck. Like, we don't have good parties here in, in the town." And then I brought <laughs> my experience, and at the same time, my partner that I'm doing music with, um, 
was also there was one warehouse rave in Hamburg he went to and he said, Wow, that's amazing, let's do this. And we have to do start something in Bremen. And this is how we started like our like our label, our party label. And then we invited the guys from Argentina that I met, like Dilo and Barem and Alejandro Mosso. Uh, Ale was here the, uh, the, in the podcast. Yeah, I saw. Hmm. And uh, Gurtz. Gurtz. See. Legend. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it was really good. And having them over and like this, it got like a connection. And the parties got bigger. We started playing on our own parties because we couldn't find a good warm-up DJ somehow. It was not like... They, we wanted that somebody's playing this minimal stuff to open up a party. More deep. And yeah. And so we f decided, okay, we just do it. We're just doing our own openings. And like this, we got into DJing and then people booked us to Berlin. And this is where we played. Our debut in Berlin was Golden Gate. Like, I think one of the most Berlin clubs that still exists. Yeah. I, I had kind of a semi-residency there at the Golden Times parties. It was it's, on it's Tuesdays such and a good Saturdays. Club. Yeah. And actually, they still uh, stay focused for a lot of years into this sound, even after it was not popular anymore. Um, at some parties on Golden Golden Gate. Yeah, hmm. yeah, but the sound coming is coming back now, and I think it's changing again. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm getting back into dub music right now. Yeah, but then I moved. Nice. Then, then we started these parties. They got super successful, but we did all illegally. Without, you know, it's like, I mean, it's now over. I don't have the to Bremen pay. ones or the Berlin, Berlin ones. No, the Bremen ones. The Bremen ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we invited more and more DJs from Berlin to Bremen. And then we got this exchange and we got invited to Berlin. Then I moved to Hamburg and I worked for the Ministry of Culture there. Okay. And then I started cultural management because I started suddenly parties and I, but I, I, I knew a lot of business, but know about like all these cultural stuff that you need to know you know like and, and how to organize an event and mm -hmm. um i mean you do it kind of of a gut feeling yeah but all the necessities that you need um to run an event properly and and, and make a business out of it sure this is what i kind of studied then in hamburg and then i worked for the ministry of culture and there i educated artists how to run an economic um, yeah, an, an economic company somehow. That's amazing. That's like, really something that is very much needed in the writing art Writing an invoice, uh, like <laughs> presenting yourself and all this, which doesn't mean that I'm good at it. But, <laughs> but it's necessary, you yeah. know. And there's this, uh, as I was saying, like this belief, or it was at least at my times, this belief that if you're an artist, you don't have to know about those stuff, you know. And in the end, that's not true. You have to know about those stuff. So yeah, this is very sad. Like they, they, they leave university and they literally don't know how to write an invoice. It's just like, and then it's just like, okay. uh, and then that, that you ha need to find, like save the recipes from your art dealer store where you buy your colors and, uh, and then you have to put this to the tax office yeah. and like all this like normal stuff that you need to know to survive as an independent artist in this world. <laughs> they, 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 they got never explained. And so... true we gave them kind of workshops where you taught them like what is this about you know like how is an economic life hmm. but like in this times as a self-employed artist how can this work and this was uh um as invented, uh subsidized by the state or yeah. yeah and it's still the company like this is a sub company from the ministry of culture it's a state-run little company which are like doing workshops and coaching for artists they also sub lending or sub renting um empty buildings so i also got the Südpol club in hamburg i got the the infrastructure for them in the in the in the real estate so that they can, could open this club so this was kind of a thing or like city development projects in an old harbor from hamburg is what i really like and this is what then cultural management is combining the ideas of of a let's say of a city or of a group or of an interest group, yeah, and then finding where to put them in this in in real life, you and know, the what do they to the funding? What do they need? Is it possible with the neighbors if they're you know like all this? Yeah, it's a key it, aspect of making something happen. Let's say yeah, and um, in, in this uh, state um, support, let's say, is was because in Hamburg you had a particularly 
progressive government or is uh, you think it's related to the um, to the government or the party uh, that was at the time or you feel like this is normal in all Germany I think this has something to do with um, in Germany we like the creative industries are I think this the second or third biggest um yeah let's say branch or industry in whole germany but if you collect them together if you say architecture music um like s uh, movies games this all together are the creative industries like the chemic industries or the automotive industries or so whatever. it makes sense uh, industry wise let's say to yeah because germany has nothing we don't have any resources we don't have Like our only resource is the brain, basically, hmm. you know, and this is the future kind of. And then the cities understood, okay, we have to give, a if you want to have a fertile soil for artists and creativity, you need to support this. Hmm. And and the club is important for artists to exchange and to have a stage and to meet and greet and and start new projects this is this is this is the hub for sure it's you know. part of the glue that sticks together all the creative scene cultural scene in society um, to keep these co in counterpoints available you know yeah now they turned yeah i think th through the pandemic it, i don't know where the people made their projects but it happened But I was invited to so many Zoom calls where I should participate to plan something, you know, which is like always like, no, that's too boring. I can't. It's, it's, it's difficult, no, to make yeah. the switch to a, a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with shows and everything, I didn't, I, I, I still don't completely uh, enjoy it. Let's say for me, it doesn't replace like the real life show, you know. No, but I think the worst thing at Zoom is that you need language like to he to to speak with someone because language has so many such a wide frequency and through the microphone and over the speakers listening to six different people it's like so it's it's draining but yeah. conversation is nice you can talk for hours and hours and hours mm. but over the the screen and the sound um, it's not the screen problem is not that big i think it's more the the sound problem is for me annoying yeah Uh, I went to the seminar in uh, Errant Sounds. It's a sound art gallery in Berlin. It was about um, uh, something like politics, poli the politics of acoust acoustics, uh, something like that. And it has to do with everything that happens with acoustics or when you're in the room or you're having a dialogue, or which is loud. If something happens, if something is covering your sound, you, cannot, you cannot understand. There's a lot of kind of uh, micro-political situations that happen. Um, and with the Zoom calls, it's like the algorithm is trying to identify what the speech from the whole sound, you know, and put it in front and mixing it live or something. But of course, it's very complex. And they have um, classes in Argentina, I think, with 40 students at the same time or something. It's, I don't know, it's a bit yeah, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, I th this homeschooling thing and everything, I think it's, people cannot learn like this. Let's see. <laughs> we'll see, yeah. There's already, so, so like, already like two years with kids in school, like having classes like that, in some countries at least. And uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And um, so after you were cultural manager for in Hamburg for the Ministry of Culture, um, you started to work at parties already, or how did you went from these educational courses Um, to the uh, music, uh, club music, uh, club culture. Yeah, I was thing. like, a, I got the job. Um, I studied in Hamburg and then I got the job. But at the same time, during my studies, we already run uh, um, like an old factory building and made parties there. Nice. With the Bachstelzen crew from, um, from Berlin. And they had a stage at Fusion. And so we got invited to do also a stage at Fusion Festival, which we did. And then the DJ career got like quite um, yeah, strong, let's say, after the first album. And so I was like touring every weekend. And This then is when you connected here, let's say, yeah. with the scene. Yeah. 
And then, then, but then we were touring internationally, and then every weekend I was kind of away, and then back to the ministry from Monday to Friday, and then it was like a seven day week. So, and it was like too much, and I had at some point to make it make a decision because I was like before a little little burnout, and then it came the partying together, and then not sleeping, and then but then working and like everything, and then I decided, okay, I I move to Berlin, I make a cut. And I go fully into music and events. That's what I did until Corona came. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice resume. I like it. Um, but it's great when you have the chance and you can decide to do it. I think that's amazing. And at that point, it made sense uh, for you to do it. Uh, and at some, to some extent, when you are really active, like DJ Live is not entirely um, um, it doesn't entirely go hand in hand with uh, eight to five uh, working schedule you know no um, especially if you just not play only at the weekends for example you know and you also play during the week <laughs> um, but I can tell I understand now because from some interviews I read from you and so I find it was very interest, very interesting f from w where you were speaking about this uh, cultural aspect or social aspects about the uh, education that these uh, encounters generate in the case of a music festival and so. And I can see now uh, why uh, you. Uh, I, I find it very interesting the way you were talking about this is because you were educated on it and also uh, did a lot in this uh, area. Let's say. You thought about this a lot before even you got into your DJ career. Yeah, and it, and it was always, we never made a party with a sponsor. We never had, like, it was always out of the crew, out of the scene, which is, like, super important for me, that things come organically growing. You, hmm. you want to do a party because you want to do it. It's in you, and you have to create this space, and you want the people to enjoy this space and being together there, and but you're not doing a party to to make money and make a business and find this sponsor and find this location and then you book the DJ while this and pop, 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 pop. This is what's happening today, mm. this business techno. Consumerism pure and not so much of this. Yeah, because it's always, essence. I mean, it's working out. I just, I, I hoped, but I don't know if this is true, that Corona made it for people unattractive and too insecure to go into this business and then hoping that just the people that really want to do it stay. But I think in the end, unfortunately, the big ones that could afford or that got also all these fundings from the state and blah, 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 that, and they, they were well organized, they can now go on. Hmm. But the small ones that did it for just for like the for the heart, they had to move into other jobs because this was what like so they su hmm. got sustained by these parties. Even and yeah, even here uh, in a country where there are funds to support uh, like uh, independent uh, uh, artists or so, there were social help. There was social help for that, but still, even here, a lot of people promoters and so. They had to change uh, industry, let's say, and they still haven't come back in a way. No, the problem I think was yeah, it's a bit sad because the whole backbone of the industry, like the good agents and promoters and and PR assistants and 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 so on, they and tour managers or whatever, they all left, and suddenly you have to find a special all the clubs. They have to find new bar stuff, and because mm -hmm. these were all people that were like in the gray zone, they left were left behind. Then theaters got fundings and got funding for their program, but there was no program. But they also did not say to the artist, for example, or to the agents, yeah, please just write an invoice so we can give you the state money. So now we have the situation in, in Germany, for example, that the theaters, they have their accounts are full with money because hmm. they got all the money, but they couldn't spend anything because they were not allowed to have a program. Hmm. But they also didn't give out the money to their to, you know, to their self-employed people, only the, the 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 fixed staff got paid, but all the self-employed artists and agents and mm. that were there, they, had, they they couldn't invoice anything. 
Yeah, because it was, it, it was kind of wrong. Like, you know, they could apply for other fundings, but it was like, it's okay. They gave you 5,000 money here, uh, 5,000 euros here, 2,000 euros there. And it was yeah, okay to once survive. In two years, so of course it's not enough. Yeah, yeah but, but somehow it was wrongly distributed somehow, this help. And I, and these agents with their agencies, they were in the middle of everything. Hmm. And yeah. Especially because in this aspect, it's in the same bag with uh, gastronomy, for example, you know, the consume of uh, culture and food was the two things that like entertainment and food was two things that were directly cut, cut off because uh, meeting with people or eating with people or eating on the streets was not uh, legal because it was a quarant general quarantine going on. And so, but someone from gastronomy who worked in gastronomy uh, their life uh, told me that everyone that worked in gastronomy, they have a saying like, people people will always want to eat, will always go out, want to go out to it so yeah. uh, they will always have these jobs you know yeah. um working in bars or restaurants or this is close also with what happens with the workers in clubs there was these things that this was always going to happen because because people always want to party and want to meet and so on but uh, when this happened it's a different story you know because it is you realize it, it is possible for this to stop or to not exist at least temporarily yeah as a source of uh, 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 income, <laughs> at least. Yeah, but I think it's this. This is a bit sad about this whole situation. That, I mean, you're. Uh, I don't want to compare it so much about it, but um, sitting in a in a theater where you just sit there and you're not talk, so there's no. You just like breathe very gently, and there you don't like infect other people or you don't get you know it's it's, mm. it's a totally different you just sit still and you're just listening to something or watching something um and i found it very hard that they got so cut off like mm. they, they cut off the culture directly because it's like okay fuck that we don't need this i mean i couldn't speak uh i couldn't give an opinion on the like let, let's say um specialist medical recommendation on this aspect like it's a social uh, pandemic and so i understand um, and I'm, I'm not one to say they should have done different or whatever. I'm just speaking from the point of view of the people that work their whole life in these uh, branches, in these industries, and suddenly the world stops, you know? And maybe they also don't have access to found, uh, state found, funds or anything. So, And maybe the difference is because theaters, even though it's entertainment, is still considered... Uh, officially more close to culture with big with capital letters and what happens in clubs for example even though it, it is culture is considered more part of uh, let's say commercial entertainment and so yeah but this is exactly where i come to criticize hmm. this this that what we are doing now is uh, we're doing education with our clubs with our parties um, and this but people are not realizing what's happening there. What happened now, which was funny, I was talking with Jake about this. Um, suddenly then the people were complaining at where I live at Treptow Park. There's so many parties in the park. And it's just like, and then just like, yeah, this is why clubs <laughs> are there. This that you are not bothered by these people. Mm. This is what we do for the society. We to take people up. out of there. <laughs> yeah, parks. because they want to go wild and everything. And if they don't have the spaces <laughs> They do it outside or wherever, and then they annoy other people. So it's be true. happy that we exist and that we take care of the kids. And it's also good to – kids consume drugs, and it's better to consume drugs with professionals that know how to do it and in a safe space than to do drugs outside in – I don't know, with their friends and buying um, shitty stuff from the dealer at the corner. You know, so it's sure. – it's, it's, we're doing kind of a social – educational service and also to experience sexuality, all these things, it's so necessary for young people. Hmm. Um, so I don't understand why we are not getting funded. And and Berghain is like one thing that got now officially 
with their taxes and everything as a high culture institution. Mm. So it, there is one step to it. Mm. But I think we should, if you're a festival, independent festival without, um, or a club without yeah. sponsors, without this, and you mm. have set like some kind of rules and some kind of, of um, a program, the program has to be diverse and this and that and no, I mean, you cannot, f you cannot, make every little club or discotheque or mm. whatever in whole Germany a cultural institution. So this would be too much, you know? Yeah, But it's complex. It's very complex. Mm. So I also understand the lawmakers that, that this is difficult, yeah. where to how to draw the line mm. and what... Because also morals kind of uh, make the blind eye into this part of society. <laughs> And life is in uh, in an urban city, uh, space, at least, which are those spaces where uh, are, are um, uh, entry points to culture, to society, to cultural and social exchange. Um, but maybe the morals uh, prevent uh, this to be legislated properly, you know, more honestly, in a way, as something that is part of life. It's not. Uh, about if uh, people don't want you to do drugs or listen to loud music, you know, or go crazy and do whatever. Um, it's about what's what's already there, what's already part of our lives as a society, of our cities. Uh, so I guess uh, this is what's complicated also about it. A lot of taboos on the uh, 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 official morals, you know. Yeah, but... You also have to understand that, I don't know, that festivals, for example, if they're global and people come from all over the world and meeting each other, making friendships, making babies, I don't know, like <laughs> falling in love. It's like they, festivals have a peacekeeping impact on, on, on global society. That's no. interesting. I, I like that because I felt that. And there's a lot of that from club culture or rape culture, or whatever you want to say, that is a lot of, uh, very much entangled to um, social political history that in the cities. In this city, for example, there's a lot of that. And what happens of special, what the potential of what can happen in that regard, most of the times it's difficult to express in words because it's something very pre-linguistic. <laughs> that happens, you know, it's something kind of abstract, but very potent. Everyone that have experienced it uh, knows what I mean, in a way. Yeah, but it's also dangerous. The state is since, uh, I think it comes from the church. There is this nice book from Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, Dancing in the Streets. Okay. It's, I can really recommend this. Yeah. Um, it's how p like party culture also evolved and why it was suppressed and then It got like, then the carnival came up because one time a year was allowed to do it. And, you know, like it's a, it's, it's a complex topic. And yeah, what's interesting about it is um, like in medieval times, back in the days, kind of the strong knight or the, the, the count or whatever, hmm. he partied with his people. Because he was also, he was a strong man with a sword and I don't know, and he could feel like he was, he was there and was mixing with the peasants and so on. But then the guns came up and suddenly the... The uh, powder, you mean? Yeah, no, the, yeah, the gunpowder. Yeah. Like, yeah. and, and then the guns came up and suddenly you were not safe anymore. And this is when the aristocrats, like when they got to the court, like to their courts and celebrating there their own little parties at their castles and everything, because it was like just too dangerous to go In this book, it was any time you could get shot, you know. Yeah. And this, she said in this book that this is one reason why you had like these safe light spaces. parties and <laughs> 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 with their safe space. <laughs> There were a lot of these rituals in the Middle Ages that um, uh, historians with a social approach understood as something very much needed for keeping the order in a way, which were days um, I cannot remember the the name right now. Um, days were all kind of carnivals, where, where all established order was um, uh, subverted. And it was promoted that this day you could go to the church and shit on the 
uh, whatever this is called, or to do like everything opposite, you know, subverting the the power of how the establishment, let's say. Yeah. Um, but this was something that was paradoxically keeping the order the rest of the year, <laughs> for example. Yeah, that's, but, but this is what also happens with the, with the, I don't know, in the tribes. You always have in the tribe someone and it is allowed to do what the others are not allowed to do, like the clown or exactly. the, the, the Hofna, like our, it was the, the jester from the court, you know, like the... I know. That he was allowed to tell the king what nobody was allowed to tell him, and he kind of kept the balance because there was one person that was allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. And it was also important for the king to have this person. Yes. So. It's a very archetypic, powerful figure in social psyche. Um, very much studied also in Tarot is the number zero, which the ones that know about about it uh, say that also represent this kind of role. You know, it can play also in the. I don't know anything about uh, traditional card games, but um, there's this the one the, which you play poker with. I the think Joker. has the Joker. Yeah, and in some games, at least I learned the Joker. You can uh, use it in the name of any other card, for example, or exactly. things like that, yeah. and, and change in every color. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how did you start it as an um, art director of Garbits? Um Good question. Uh, yeah, it was it was it was kind of interesting. Um, they asked a friend of mine to do the production, and he asked me if I want to be his assistant. And then he became, but then his uh, girlfriend, former girlfriend, became pregnant, and he said, "I cannot do the job because it's exactly <laughs> when the birth date is, right place, right time." And I'm just like, "Yeah." And then he was just, "Okay." Then the festival asked me, "Okay, do you want to take over?" And I'm just like, "Yeah, but I don't do it alone." And then Johannes from the uh, from the Holzmarkt and the, the owner of Kata Blau from the club said, okay, then we do it together. And this is how we like, and then we found each other and we really liked each other and it was like super nice team. Holzmarkt 25 is one of the other collectives, uh, Berliner collectives that are, are part of this uh, festival, no? Yeah, it's the Bachstelzen you know. mm. and, uh, and the Bar 25 people, like mm. former Bar 25 people, which mm. is now the Holzmarkt. Um, and they are running together with a Polish company um, to gather this, the festival. So the Polish company owns the place and we're bringing the content mm -hmm. and trying to make it work, which is not so easy in Poland. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is super beautiful and I love it, but with the politics there, it's yeah. and you see again that European Union is not <laughs> so easy to deal with sometimes. Administratively, yes. <laughs> uh, I heard the uh, the festival was cancelled by the government that was allowing this to happen for many years and three days uh, before it opened, the, you managed to solve it. How was how was <laughs> this? I don't know. They, I literally don't know. It's always like okay, we don't we don't have a permission, but everybody's coming. We sold all tickets and like we're just sitting there and it's like <laughs> okay. What are we doing now? And then it's like, oh, we just go for it. It will work out. And then like literally two hours before everything, then the permission was sent out. Um, this is what I mean. It's just, it's then it's, it, it's becoming like it's Polish rural cultural politics and somehow they work it out every hmm. time, but it got more and more complicated year you by have, year. You have someone in charge for this? Uh, yeah, yeah. One of our team mates uh, from Poland, he's dealing with all these issues. Hmm. Mm. But it's like in the beginning you start kind of undercover, you know, you're just a small festival, nobody noticed, and then you just get bigger, 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 and suddenly it's all over the world, this name, and then they're realizing, oh, um, we have a festival here. <laughs> I've heard so many uh, crazy stories. I'm really envious. Like, I've never been. Ah, oh, you never been? No. Yeah, but then the, it, luckily um, we, we are in this rural zone where where around there is nothing, you know. But so. it's kind of like a paradise or something like that. I mean, the, it's a, na natural, it's a reserve natural reserve around yeah. it, hmm. so not on our place. This is this is excluded, but around this, it's a lot of lakes and forest, and it's very it's a very magical place. It's also an old place. They found like Celtic, um, wow, 
ruins there from 1200 I will before totally Christ. trip uh, I start thinking about druids and so if I'm there <laughs> and the trees that are like they're super old I mean there are trees that are 500 600 years old um, or even older and and it's also interesting because before the the village the village is from 1490 or something wow. where Columbus traveled to in, to, yeah. to America <laughs> And My continent didn't exist at the time. <laughs> <laughs> right, it exists in the map. At the, in the maps, at in least. The map, yeah. <laughs> no, but then they they um, it was German and it was that and blah blah. And now it's like Polish, but but the the country itself is so it has it had so much energy. And this is why we, when we came there, the the place is you cannot say no. We are not doing this because they invited us to, and asked us if we want to do a festival there. Hmm. It's not that we said we want to do a festival. Okay. So it was more like, hey, there is this place. Have a look. Hmm. And then we went and we were just like, okay, we have to do this. And you inherited this role kind of. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. But given your uh, resume, I would say you are a very good fit for this role because of your background and what you did before. Yeah, I think I did a good job the last years, but I'm also now realizing that... Um, the production itself is very hard. I mean, this is now I did it for like six years and or almost seven then, but then Corona came and it, it costs a lot of energy because it's really like 20 hour shifts for weeks. I can imagine. Yeah. And it's, it's at some point now I'm over 40. Mm. It becomes to a point where you say, okay, I cannot handle this anymore. Mm. You know? So, This is where I like think I'm going now, leaving the production side more and going more into the cultural, like I'm uh, like in the art direction that hmm. what I did before as well, and also we're trying to get fundings now and creating a cultural club mm -hmm. which is organizing more events on the ground, mm -hmm. and for this like we would like to get EU fundings and so I get more into this role That's now great. in writing concepts yeah. and. That's great because it started like a crazy idea in a way, like small and kind of grew up because of its authenticity or something like that. Could you say? Yeah, it was like we tried. It was like, <laughs> and and this was a bit also a problem. Now we but tried something. Big, way. We tried something and then it went well, and we did try it <laughs> again. And suddenly it got so big that we were like, okay, we can't handle this anymore. Like it's such, and then we had to like slow down a bit and just organize ourselves better than also building a fence the whole thing didn't have a fence and then suddenly people like in fusion we had this problem that people were swimming through the lake jumping over the, over the bushes and suddenly we had like I don't know 15,000 people on the ground that were not supposed to be so much you know like they came in also Polish people from everywhere and like control and now it be, then it becomes like a business you have to control it and make it safe and Oh, and it's all these things. If you just want to do a party, like. <laughs> <laughs> how naive. Yeah, but cute also. But this is the this is this is. I think always the magic happens between chaos and order on this thin line. Of course, you know when it's too much chaos, then it's not good for the people. And if it's too much order, then you also you know like I can yeah. say that the when you go to Holland, for example, to the Netherlands, the parties are so well organized. I mean. Yeah. You know, Perfect. Too much. Too much. But <laughs> at some point, then the, sometimes the magic is missing. It's just like these big raves. They're functioning. They're super good. But somehow there is no space for, for, for the magic anymore. Mm -hmm. And this is what we try to keep open all the time. Because you manage always to uh, stay true to the values you were promoting uh, about um, this uh, authenticity, making this about the encounter and not about the brands or not so much about selling uh, or consuming something, but more about connecting and perceiving and experiencing uh, and promoting uh, certain values openly uh, that had to do with integration, peace and so. Uh, and I don't know, but I guess uh, like damage reduction, education, something into these lines, Um, which it's a very uh, well-intended uh, action in a way. And as we were saying before, it's something very need very much needed 
in society. But of course, when this is gets big, you have this paradox of control. You have to organize it and control it so it doesn't get out of control. <laughs> yeah, I think the best example is um, do you, if you want if you run a successful party, I think the most important thing is your crew. So you need a big crew that kind of holds the space. You know, you, you can organize an event to make money, then you just need a minimum amount of people at every position, and then you just let the people, the guests come in and make the party, but then you, then it's out of your hands. Then mm. something, then you're just like providing the music, the lights, the food, the drinks, and that's it, you know? And then something is happening on your ground, but you don't know what. And mm. then many people coming and just looking and nobody's really don't know how to party and then also these weird things happen like sexual harassments and you know then it then it becomes dirty Very delicate and complex yeah and but to 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 sustain like to make a good party of five days you need professionals that know how to do this and that they go with you through mm. this it's, it's kind of a shamanistic experience mm. you know to go through it even if you're tired and mm. going over it and right and you need the people that are experienced in this and this is our crew True. and uh, but our crew is super big so from a from an economic perspective it is like what you're 800 people that's that's already a party and so yeah yeah that's our party this is our party crew that is everywhere present on all dance floors mm. and and keeping the energy good, you know, and mm -hmm. taking care of the people, taking care of our guests, and then all the friends are coming that are part friends and crew, and so this makes kind of two to three thousand people are like highly professional ravers, musician, mm -hmm. artists that make this party special, and the rest is very welcome to experience mm -hmm. this with us. But I we're not doing mm -hmm. this for other people. I mean, yeah, we're doing this for other people, but not for them to come to spend money and making the money mm. um this is not the purpose it's to make this party right <laughs> this because, is what we love because one of the things about this festival is like all, all almost all workers involved want to be there partying also in a way and uh, yeah everyone. people that yeah and this is something that you cannot buy let's say that if you don't build it organically like you said before you know if you're not authentic from that point this is not uh, viable, let's say, you know, that even the artists, even the workers uh, are able to exchange to be there, you know. Uh, I think that's very valuable. And also this concept of education for the party, <laughs> I think it's very important because, as we say, it's part of society, of part of the day-to-day -day life from a normal person nowadays. And if you do this, uh, if you do this commercially, you have no guidance at, uh, at all, no, no orientation. No, you just have neutral places, as you say, where you go consume, you know, and this is very risky. And nowadays it's very much in fashion to do ayahuasca-oriented um, experiences, for example. And I think your analogy is correct. I mean, this should go also a party uh, club culture should also go in this direction, more socially conscious in a way. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it is, but it's it's all all about the people doing it. So you cannot you cannot go there like as a teacher and teach True. teach your guests. You can try to sensitize them to your topics. You know, we don't want people to throw cigarette butts on our grounds, but and they all know, but still this happens when you're like high and um, blah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. You, you forget about yourself and you're doing it. But then we have the people, the rangers and um, our, um, yeah, Förster, I don't know, like what is the... Yeah, what is um, the, uh, uh, what's the name in uh, in Spanish? Is the forest keeper. Yeah. <laughs> what, <laughs> forest keeper. Yeah, and then and they they reminding you, you know, like so it's that you're in a special place, and it's also the conscious team that is helping to make the people conscious about how to behave, you know, on the grounds with each other and interact, and this is also what Berlin club culture is about, you know, in hmm. the, in in many clubs or should be about let's should say. be about yeah should but still be about <laughs> yeah it. it it, I don't know if it's, we'll see, but I think it's coming back and getting stronger again. Um, but I think this is also important that many people from our festival are promoters from 
all over the world and they're taking this with them and bringing it to their festivals and so it's a learning process of mm -hmm. interchanging our ideas no mm -hmm. and our values and i think this is something that's very important globally i think it's 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 also nice to have a i don't know compass charlotte de witte rave in belgium I think it's also good. It's also Tomorrowland is also fine. You know, people having fun and then it's 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 all serving our um, purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do it their way. I don't agree with their commerciality. How about? But mm -hmm. in the in the core, it's fine. The more of this we have in society, the better the global society can evolve. You know, mm. and I think the more people starting festivals and starting parties, and especially young people should go back to this and experience themselves doing this instead of funding a startup company which is not giving you anything <laughs> just money but you don't ex you, you, you don't experience anything with this hmm. you know to understand first how to connect and uh, get along uh, with your fellow humans it's, living it's, around it's you about in society experience and losing and losing hmm. yourself out of time and space and i don't know and then also like Age is not a problem. Old people with young people, rich with poor. Right. Like, I don't know. You know, everyone is there. And mm. I think people spend too much time in, 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 in the construction of urbanities. And, mm. But urbanity is not, uh, not... It's a space where things function, but you should not get lost in urbanity because it's not healthy. Right, because this uh, garbage promotes also like na being in nature. Right, this is what you do it in the national park, and so it has to do also <laughs> trying to promote getting out of the cement or Berghain or so. Am I wrong? Yeah, we, I always laugh so hard because we had the, we had, like just in Greece we had an acid trip together with friends, and I'm super personally I'm super annoyed by this new phenomenon that everybody is having their boombox and having their their party somewhere. You're going into the park, and at every five meters there's another boombox and another. Um, playlist running and you're yeah. just like please we're in the nature this is about there's nature. no cautious whatsoever about that aspect yeah and i complained about this and, then, <laughs> and inga said like ah very interesting organizer of garbage festival <laughs> <laughs> that you don't like music and nature and just like no no, no. <laughs> it was a good comeback <laughs> <laughs> i didn't mean that like i mean if it's if it's kind of curated yeah and then Especially, and, and you know, the, we are making so much effort. I mean, this is the longest process, the curation of this festival. When, who is playing, like, how are the playing times? When is what's happening? And this is so much content to hmm. manage. And then really enjoy this, go there, but don't bring your own boom. And then sitting in the camp <laughs> and, like, playing your own sound there. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's this... It's a bit aut aut autistic behavior. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that when I was young, I was also listening with my with my Walkman, like super loud, heavy metal, that I want to listen to yeah. everyone around me, that how cool I am. But yeah. but now it's becoming, it's weird. But it's even, like even, even old also. people listening to their folk music in the train or something. It's I have a theory. I think it's like this need for the product. This new product was there, you know, like uh, portable wireless boomboxes, Bluetooth boomboxes. And people felt forced to use them, even though it was not entirely comfortable to go out in the street with something sounding loud for everyone, you know? I think that something like from this order is happening there. But can you, you remember know? back in the days, it was only the super weirdos that were playing loud music on their yeah. bikes or on the street, like for themselves? Yeah. Um, or like the ghetto blast with the hip hop guys and, yeah. and, and like. <laughs> Yeah, right, the or original something. boombox, let's say. Yeah, this was kind Brooklyn, of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was like only the, the, the weirdos that were like playing their music outside loud. And now mm -hmm. everybody's just doing it. Yeah. And <laughs> this is annoying me a lot <laughs> because, and also because music is so bad. Like a lot of the music <laughs> is just so bad. And they are, the music is produced to to sound like this on these boomboxes. Yeah. And then, you know, like this whole. Yeah, I agree. I think a lot of these people. Uh, just got a boombox for their birthday or something and they are not maybe into music or anything you know and they feel obligated to use it and so this is why you yeah it's, it's just like running. affect polluting like the soundscape of the city in a way. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about nature and to uh, start with the closure 
um, because this is a very central topic in the things garbage promotes and a part of the experience of uh, making yourself sensitive to something that to, nowadays is very, very urgent that has to do with nature and climate change and uh, getting out of event organization, let's say. Uh, how, what is your hunch or do you have a feeling uh, how, if we are going to make peace uh, like uh, in industrial uh, technological society uh, with nature in a way to uh, uh, be in terms with this at the point that climate change would not be a threat anymore or do you think about those kind of things mm, as a festival or personally personally oh yeah um, no, I think festivals are there for the neurotic disturbed urban people to get reconnected with nature hmm. and I, th I I'm I'm looking very positive in the future actually that somehow I think people understand and the architecture understands the open gardening you know like uh, things coming back micro farming and a lot of young people now that are like like the generation Z like after the millenn millennials they're super political Uh, political, super interested, very motivated. And they're using all their digital skills they have, the programming skills, everything to found like to make a real change. They're not doing startups to sell them to venture capitalists and making money. They really that's more millennials. You say there's more millennials. Millennials this are like the yuppies in a way. Yeah, a bit like a bit like, like. this. It's about like okay, let's make money fast hmm. in with with new concepts and selling mm. this concept, not not about, I really want to do this job, I want to work, I just want to make an idea, make it big, sell it, and like, uh, 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 <laughs> you know, this kind of, and then yeah. it's also horrible that everybody's now with this, with this smartphone trading apps, and this is this is the devil, that you are sitting on a, in a, like, oh, it's so easy, I just like made 500 euros with like, boop, 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 but yeah. this is what, what's, what's wrong in the system. This in whole economy, so shit, shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think you have to I be careful. I see the advertisement on YouTube all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. No? They think I have money to invest. It's amazing. The algorithm doesn't work that no, well. They, no, they, 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 they just want you two, you two euros that you have left that you can spend. This is what they want. Very. <laughs> <laughs> But this is on a on a bigger scale a lot. No, but I've I don't know. I don't understand. I don't like this so much. How it how. It, how it evolves in this way. But you also have a positive view, let's say, with technology that we can reach uh, something new. You have hope on the new generation. I think, I think actually if we accept and we all take ourselves a little bit back and not take ourselves too important and also if we leave some things out of our all-day life and consume less, then we can all have a really big party and indulge again And nice things, you know, mm. because like, like it's not about it's it's fine to consume and to mm. be hedonistic and to in, indulge in luxury, mm. but the luxury is now it, it it took a wrong turn. Luxury is be naked outside dancing in the sun, yeah, and uh, having a nice and cold beer. Mm. And luxury is not being on a on a on a big yacht with caviar and I don't know hmm. uh, ugly silicon tit babes I don't know this is not yeah. this is uh, people are misguided by by these concepts of what what luxury means hmm. yeah so one of those concepts is lacking social justice in a way like being available available for a huge chunk of the population let's say those who can't afford to have parties in yachts yeah but this is this is not something that that you want to reach hmm. it's not nice it's not it's also it's it's quite it's very boring not approved <laughs> no and it's also you look at these rich people they they most of them they look shit because they don't have taste they just buy expensive stuff and put them everything together and then you suddenly go <laughs> oh that's horrible because they don't they're not connected with themselves hmm. and, and and who they are hmm. so they don't know what they like so hmm. they just buy expensive things and put it all together. I was just like in a flat of somebody that made millions with like cryptos, or I don't know. And it was like, everything was so expensive, but it was such a horrible, f like designed flat yeah. <laughs> where you don't want to live, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm, like, I don't understand. But this is, this is also the people in St. Moritz or I don't know, like 
this, like the, you know that you have these art galleries in St. Moritz, which is just like with diamonds and gold and I don't know. Right. What <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this had nothing to do with art. It's like people with a lot of money to buy something. Uh, uh, yeah. They say art. Yeah, but, but I I also understand that that people in in less favorable countries or social strong countries, especially like people in, 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 in Africa, they have smartphones and everything. They see everything that's possible in the world and of course they want to leave and go to us. So if we sell them the smartphones and give them the content, we should not be um, hmm. wondering about why they're coming to us. First we take the minerals from their countries to make the chips, to make the iPhones. Yeah, and then we, we, we take sell your minerals, back. sell you your phones, but then please don't come and get... <laughs> Like and be yeah. inspired by our luxury. Yeah, you know, so it's very unfair. So I think they're very welcome here, everyone. I also I also don't believe there is the fact that they all want this as a better life. It's just an eruption of uh, imperialistic capitalism, they say, and it also in culture because this erupts in the, their culture in the form of the iPhone or whatever. But it's not something entirely conscious or chosen, you know. This is already, we, as you say, we make them part of something that they cannot access to, you know. Yeah. It's very sad s somehow, no? What's happening? And in which ways you think this could change for good? Good question, but... Um, <laughs> it's difficult for me to be optimistic. This is why I always hope for the guests to, if possible, to tell me how this could go better. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if, if you think about it uh, back to a tribal society, and I think this is what we can also learn from, um, from for example, African countries, yeah? uh, how to be happy in a tribe, and this is what, what maybe the urbanity or what we should hmm. focus more on, is like more into the family, sharing more things again hmm. you know so that you this is what like the the capitalist society wants us all single hmm. and con in in consume every egoist yeah no that we everybody needs a tv everybody needs a washing so machine every like everybody needs a car like sure. so to, to make it as smaller and smaller smaller parts hmm. so that they can sell more products but if we're living in communities then you only need one thing of each hmm. and then things like i think it's it's Getting back into more familiar but patchwork structures, mm -hmm. and your and and choose your family, mm -hmm. and then just consume less, exchange your clothes. I don't know, like it it it, it will work out. Hmm. You just have to practice it a bit more. It's all about sure. practice. Getting contact with um, the more basic first. Yeah, they say if there w uh, would be an electromagnetic pulse or a cataclysm event or some sort the most likely people who would survive and develop after this would be these tribes, for example, because they know already uh, how to live like that, you know? <laughs> and um, this portion of society that we're uh, living and dreaming in this uh, kind of fantasy technocratic world that uh, suddenly stops to exist, you know? Uh, when you don't have uh, electricity, for example, <laughs> or we don't, when you don't have running gas or water or these boxes that you mentioned that we are enclosed in, you know, uh, they are also preventing us from realizing, you know, that sometimes in co a lot of things in community uh, with solidarity uh, uh, would be much better. Um, but it's difficult to be conscious about that, you know, and to communicate that in a way that is not um, invasive or traumatizing or... Or colonizing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, this is what happens also with the festival that they think, oh, now the Germans are coming and telling us how to party, but... Um, again, because they are from Poland. The Germans are coming again to yeah. invade or something. Yeah, yeah. This, this was, this is actually a topic there in the region of the border between Poland and Germany. Of that, course, that we are coming now um, because, like you know, we are this the the Speerspitz. I don't know, like that. Um, I mean, we are the era that yeah. the, the, you know the the, the point of yeah. the era of the party people in Berlin and super open-minded 
everything is fine all that you know everybody's accepted it's very inclusive mm. and but at the same time it's it's also very decadent at some point and mm. then you you move over to in, in, to this countryside and then the people are just like who are these guys from Berlin and this is a Catholic country and blah 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 and suddenly we're all naked ba bathing in their lake so it's you know what's happening it's it's a bit it's too a much there's a friction also there's a friction course. but hmm. we have to deal with this and we are only mean it in a good way we're not yeah but we have to also respect their values hmm. and things have to I think things are going slower and this is a bit Our problem right now is that we don't have time, but pe humans are too slow sometimes. <laughs> I think we, are, we have to pay a price, but in the end, uh, the earth is just the earth. The earth will recover. Hmm. It's, it's, it's our problem. We have of to course, organize. The earth will forget about us very quickly when it recovers. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's, it's, we're, we're on a good way. And it's also fine that, but we are the first, especially in Germany or in these states, we have to reduce and we have to um, cut ourselves down that other countries have the space hmm. yeah, to develop, hmm. especially also like educationally. I think this is the most, because we understand, but a lot of people don't even understand. Hmm. You know, there is this fisherman somewhere, he's not... He doesn't understand that this is it's wrong to throw his Coca-Cola body into the into the ocean. He has no <laughs> feeling about this. <laughs> Can be, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I met I, a, I met an I met a uh, teacher in the Himalayan mountains in India, yeah. and he told me like the trash problem. You you you're on five thousand meters system when you're walking there and you find trash and you're just like, how is this going here? And it's like also it's not the tourist most of the time. It's also like young people living in the Himalayan, and this is a rebellious act for hmm. them. You know, like okay, I throw this now into the nature, and it's like this when you, you know in puberty, like I want to rebel, hmm. and they throw trash into hmm. the divine nature, and not thinking about it really. What happens? And do you think it's possible to come back from that? Yeah, I think you have as a parent. You have to make a good image. Um, you you've been recently a parent for the first time. No? Yeah, I have a daughter now. She's 14 months. Did this change your view on these kind of basic things? I'm thinking of the future and so. Yeah, entirely. <laughs> this is also why I like okay, um, like how is this going to happen? Like what is what is, <laughs> like how will it be for her? It's like it's very intense. I also have big fights. Like I, I, I discussed with my mother that she, as a grandma, gave her voice at the last elections to her, um, to my, to my daughter, okay, to her grandchild, that she voted like for her more or less. <laughs> so I think this is also a change that old people have to give more power to young people. Yeah. If old people getting older and older and older and older and and holding the power, hmm. just imagine if people can live. 300 years and you have suddenly a dictator like Putin for 300 years hmm. now it was always like okay people get old and then they die and then something new can evolve hmm. but if humans are getting older and older and older then power is is kept in their hands but this, yeah. and young people have it more and more difficult to to find their way no hmm. yeah but this should be possible to articulate inside democracy to make uh, to equalize these weights of power not only between the rich and the poor, but also from the, between the old people and the young people and so. Yeah, I but still hope that this will be possible to articulate inside democracy, you know? This is my little part that stays optimistic about it. Yeah, I think, and there we come back to the tribes where you live with young and old people together and where hmm. communication is still, like, vivid, hmm. you know, because in... Fortunately, here in Germany, like all people are more or less like kept out of the all day life more and more and more. But they still it's should true. vote. And like it's somehow it's not working. It's weird. Together. Yeah, it's weird. Definitely. And young people are not allowed to vote, but they should work, pay taxes. And like, you know, like it's yeah. always it's like with 16, you're allowed yeah. to do so many things, but you're not allowed to vote. But. Yeah, I can also understand that some people with 16 shouldn't vote and they're not, they, you can easily manipulate them and blah, blah, hmm. blah. But it could change the program of the of the parties hmm. if there are more young people 
hmm. to vote, you know, because then they would address more the younger topics. Hmm. And I'm I'm quite happy what happened now that like the, the old government is out and new governments coming in and new coalition with the green strong green party and blah blah. Yeah. It's it's kind of on a good way. It's a bit too slow, and I don't understand why people are not voting left. But I also don't understand. It's something that, that the really AfD, who is the far right uh, party, uh, lost a little bit, but actually uh, has doubled the votes of, as the the left, for example. Yeah. So, and the coalition in the end won't be possible with the left. So it's like a center with the FDP that is a um, uh, liberal. Yeah, the, the FDP is more like this new startup generation of like young successful entrepreneurs that want. Because what happened was that the SPD, that is the Social Democrats, uh, got ahead of the CDU, and this was like an historic shift in a way. And now they have to make a coalition with the Greens, yeah, uh, which is already let's say more progressive. And instead of the left, I don't know, but possibly they will make it with this liberal. Yeah, um, I think party. this is the, the this is what's going to happen, but we'll see. Let's see. <laughs> like we say, the Boy Scouts uh, hope for the best, be prepared for the worst. <laughs> yeah, or um, blessed be this moment. In a blessed be this moment. Trust yourself. Expect the best. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to know more from Fritz uh, projects and music and stuff. We will leave some, leave some link, links in the description. Thank you, Fritz, for being here. Thank you, Pablo. Yes. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to give us a like and a comment under the video. If you want to see more, click here. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel.